Welcome, everybody. This is Jay Bissell from Equipment Zone. Excited that you've tuned in today to another Equipment Zone training event. Uh, this is a DTG DTF Tech Talk. You should see three happy humans on your screen. Myself talking now. I'm Jay. He's Terry. And that guy down there, that's Roy. Terry Combs, Roy Huseman are aces in the hole. We have a wonderful schedule for you uh, today. So thrilled that so many of you registered and are watching this live. For those that you couldn't make it live, you're watching after the fact. We're, we're also proud of you for finding us and watching. Can't wait. This is a great, great session. And I really want everybody to know we've got tons of info. So it would not surprise me, guys, if this doesn't happen once a month for the rest of the year. I really hope we can get to that kind of a rhythm. We'll see how it goes. I'm not going to make any crazy promises, but um, so grateful that you tuned in again. Jay from Equipment Zone here. I'm the marketing guy. Terry is our senior, most senior sales representative and trainer. And uh, Roy Huseman, also a senior technician, our lead tech. Um, gentlemen, how are you? First of all, is everybody, is everybody doing well? I'm doing great. Yep. Awesome. Great. Yep. Awesome indeed. Well, listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let Terry take it over. We've decided to have a couple of quick um, discussion points before we actually go into the questions and share the slides. So, Terry, I'm going to turn it over to you. If you uh, if you've got something that you wanted to say, an important announcement, or um, you know, go USA. I don't know. What are you going to say? Well, yeah, Jay. I just wanted to take a minute to talk, uh, just a moment to talk about training and service and support after you buy your equipment. You know, there's a lot of equipment you buy out there. I'm I'm an old screen printer. I could go to a to a show and buy a manual screen printing press and take it home and read a couple of instructions and boom, I'm good to go. And and I'm never going to call the manufacturer, but uh, this is not plug and play equipment. You know, there, this takes training. It takes ongoing support for DTG and DTF or the combination of DTG and DTF. So, and, and, and Jay and Roy, you both know this is fairly new technology. Uh, you're going to need help along the way. DTG is, is less than 20 years old. That that's in its infancy really in, in, in terms of, of garment decorating and DTF barely two years old. So, you know, Service and support are after the sale are critical, crucial parts uh, of the purchase. So, you know, uh, proper installation, maintenance, uh, 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 training on both of these is critical to get started on the right foot. And you know, and and we see it, and both of you have heard it from from customers. Yeah, I bought this machine in China. Uh, but uh, but the support wasn't actually in English and not exactly the same time zone. And can you guys help me out? And, uh, you know, all those machines end up on the scrap heap, scrap heap and, and we hear it every single day. <laughs> and so uh, not only are you going to need somebody to talk to, but you're going to need supplies. Occasionally, you're going to need a part. And, and I don't know about you guys, but when I was running a production operation, I, I couldn't wait three weeks to get a part to get my machine up and running again. So, you know, I'm going to get on my, my soapbox, uh, Jay and Roy here for, for 20 seconds. Oh, preach you, away, brother. Go. Preach away. Let it go. Let it go. <laughs> my, my dad was a Southern Bible pounded preacher in Saltville, Virginia. I'll just give you that uh, <laughs> when I was a child. So, uh, so Equipment Zone does offer support on both coasts. Uh, and and they were backed up by Epson support for the DTG printers and and uh, you know I just want to remind everybody that's listening equipment zone support is always free for as long as you own the equipment so I, I just wanted to 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 talk about that for a second because ongoing training ongoing support is critical to your success and and that's what we do here at Equipment Zone so so Jay. Are we ready to go? <laughs> We're fired up now. Listen, Terry, thank you for sharing that because I, I hope people understand truly the sentiment in which you delivered. You were a production manager. You, you have run very large operations. You're still a trainer and you're right. The, the equipment is a key component, but the service after the sale is critical. So we know we're not perfect. We've never claimed to be. And I love the fact that the owner and president of our company, Harry Oster, often says, we're occasionally gonna drop the ball, but we're gonna be perfect at helping you fix it after the fact. And we're gonna be relentless and we're gonna keep giving you help. So let us do the best we can, which is all we hope to do and um, provide you some TLC and some support and some tech help after the fact. 
The good news is we don't mean to scare you. Not everything is going to be a giant technical disaster. Um, far from it. If you're a current DTG um, operator and you have a, a product from Epson, whether that's the F2000, which is starting really, we're starting to hear a lot less about that, the first version, and then the F2100, and also some of our, oh, it, it did it again. Did you see that? I don't know what's going on. Oh my goodness. That, we tested for that. So can you even hear me, Terry? Because I can Yeah, hear I can you. hear you. Uh, it's a little bit of Max Headroom going, but you, I can hear you perfectly. So. Okay, that is crazy. And there are people out there going Max Headroom. I've not heard that. Oh, in there we go. 30 uh, you years. know what? <laughs> Sorry, guys. Yeah, I was doing some headbanging there. Some, some loud music going on behind me. No, I, I tested this earlier. That was pretty funny. Sorry about that. Uh, if it glitches again, hopefully it won't happen. But um, we, we never was... lost your audio, though. We never okay, lost okay. your audio. So Thank you're you all good. So, where I was going with that was just to say, um, we recognize that this is the learning curve and that it is. And, and we're excited because we're going to meet it head on. We've got people like Roy who have tremendous experience on multiple different printers, different kinds of printers. Um, but our expertise really is apparel decoration through DTG printing. Someone in the chat has already asked, is DTF going to replace DTG printing? I want to ask that question to both of you. This is a curveball. This wasn't planned. So before we jump in, I'm going to throw it back to you, Terry. But what do you think? What's your opinion, Terry? Do you see DTF taking over and eclipsing DTG, direct garment? Absolutely not. Uh, this is just another tool. Just the way DTG was another tool, uh, just the way... Um, you know, all the other processes that come along. This is just another tool that, you know, when I started out as a, as a screen printer, I was just a screen printer. Today, it's incredibly unusual for someone to be just an embroiderer, just a screen printer, just uh, cut vinyl. And, and this is just another tool for us to use. And, and we've all heard it, you know, for years. When uh, 20 years ago, I heard Industry veterans say, well, DTG is going to replace screen printing. And I'm like, no, no, this is just another tool for screen printers to take care of all those uh, family reunion orders that that we uh, tear our hair out about. So <laughs> I had a lot of those, by the way. Uh -oh. So <laughs> my goodness. What do you say, Roy? I know. Thank you, Roy, for, by the way, Roy's chat way in the chat answers the questions. Um, and people love the Max Headroom reference, Terry. So that also dates you, but it's pretty good. Um, <laughs> Roy, you're on mute, but do you see anything in terms of replacing? Do you see DTF like replacing it, or is it just like Terry said, complementary? No, I think it's complementary. I mean, it's like adding embroidery or any other piece of equipment to the mix. Once DTF gets to the point where it's a uh, bigger volume than you can handle with the DTG, then you can buy a, a DTF machine like we have and. Mm -hmm move up and buy a second uh, DTG machine or a third or fourth or, you know, I see them as being two separate items myself, um, you know, because DTF does have a different feel to it, but then it uh, does do a lot of great things as far as being able to go on a lot of different substrates that you couldn't even DTG on. So mm -hmm. uh, definitely opens up new markets for people. Um, I don't know if, uh, I mean, I can go through and show some of the items and get in front of the camera. I don't know if everybody's familiar with some of the stuff that DTF can do other than just doing fabrics. Well, let's hold that off for now. That's a great, that's a great idea. Maybe if we get something towards the, the end, if we have some time, I'd like to show some of those, but I do want to get to these core questions and really this will be the, the starting point of our tech talk. So apologize for those of you that were like, just get into it. But we wanted to set the stage. We also wanted to have that brief discussion and let Terry do some preaching from the pulpit. Um, but now we're going to switch gears and we're going to get into tech talk. I'm going to throw this back over to Terry. And I just want people to understand that these were taken from our Facebook group. So y'all are invited to that. We have a closed Facebook group um, for F2100 owners and operators. Um, so please join us there. We're not picking on anybody for the references that I'm going to show. These are what we, we often call these as, as frequently asked questions. We, we hear them and they're repeated in different ways, but they tend to all be in the same heading or the same subject. So those were the first three or four that we wanted to share. And you're going to see, um, I'm going to, I'm going to make sure that Terry's got first role here. So Terry, why don't I kick it back over to you and, um, I'm going to share my screen and and this will be surprising to you, Terry, because you haven't seen this yet. So 
go ahead and take it away, my friend. All right. Well, and, and this is a question, of, obviously, for the star of our show, Roy. Um, the question is about specifically DTG printing and uh, on 5050 sweatshirts or any 5050 garment. Uh, the the um, question was, we have a lot of hoodies and sweatshirts to print. And with the start of spring sports, we're sure to have more. Can we print on 5050 products? Well, I would say yes, you can, but you need to be aware that a lot of the 5050 products that are out there uh, do have dye migration issues. So you need to lower the temperature, uh, make sure you have the right amount of pretreat. And then also, uh, as far as lowering the temperature, that would be on the cure. Okay. Otherwise, you're going to activate that dye and it's going to migrate into the print, as you could see in that image where the red shirt turned pink in the white area. And it also uh, stained the rest of the, the image as well. So as Jay brings that back on the screen. Uh, so the left side was on the printer before cure. The right side is after the cure. So you could see how bright the white is there. Uh, the other thing that you want to be aware of too is, is a lot of people think that they need to jump and uh, cure the shirts right away. Um, I always feel, especially uh, with sweatshirts and things of that nature, let them sit for a few minutes and uh, let that water migrate into the fabric from the ink. And then you have less issues with uh, um, fabric or not fabric, but the, uh, the uh, fibers possibly sticking up through the image or little white specks or things like that appearing uh, in the job. So uh, just to get a better quality uh, image right after you print and to continue with that quality, it's just best to let the shirt sit. Um, again, three to five minutes, I say. And a lot of people say, well, what do I do? I, you just set it off to the side. As you're pre-treating and curing on one end, and you only have one heat press, let's say, um, then you can go ahead and pre-treat and cure another shirt, and then just set the other shirt aside, and then bring that back into the heat press later on. Uh, obviously, the key is to continue to feed the printer. If the printer isn't fed, your production stops. So you definitely want to keep that printer moving and not let it sit idle. You can always juggle a heat, uh, the curing of pre-treat and curing of ink in the heat press as you go. Yeah, that's, a, that's an issue we hear a lot, uh, Roy, especially as it relates to 50-50. So it's almost like two issues here, Terry. We're talking about can we, should we print on 50-50 blends? And then what happens when I'm doing hoodies and sweatshirts that are red or maroon and some other colors where we start to see the dye migration? So it's really a one-two punch. And Terry, I knew you'd kind of get a giggle and be excited when you saw this graphic. <laughs> well, for anybody uh, who uh, is a regular listener here to our webinars, you probably know that I moved to Phoenix 20 years ago from Kansas City. So how about them Chiefs? Uh, the uh, <laughs> <laughs> next thing, uh, and, and by the way, I live one mile from the stadium where the Super Bowl was played. But, uh, you know, and, and also you have to be a little judicious. Yes, uh, Sanmar or or SNS or or whatever supplier, they ha they have a sale on fifty fifty red sweatshirts. Well, you know, with with DTG and and DTF, you can demand a higher price if you print on an eighty twenty or a ninety ten or one of the the blended sweatshirts that has a, a hundred percent cotton facing. Yes, it's going to cost a little bit more money. The difference in your print quality is going to be night and day. You're not going to have to do a lot of uh, a lot of tweaking and a lot of uh, experimentation to get the saleable product, not the perfect product, the saleable product. Whereas if if you print on a especially a sweatshirt, again a blend, but with with a white facing. In other words, the the outside of the fabric is 100% cotton. Uh, that that print's going to look fabulous on there and and. You know, sometimes uh, going, you, you know, a lot of a lot of times screen printers will try to find the cheapest shirt they can find. I think the market is going away from that. I think the market's going towards a better quality garment. And and most of the most consumers out there are willing to play, pay a little bit more money for a higher quality garment as well. 
you know, you talked briefly, Terry, about um, tweaking it. And so what, what, would the, what would the workaround be or could be? And not, not, I'm not asking for the perfect prescription, but based on our knowledge, and I saw that Roy is talking in the chat, talking about lowering the temp. If I, if I had to do it, 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 was, it was for my, my own kids, you know, football game or something. And I had 50-50s and I had to do them on red. What, is there anything either of you could talk about that might be a potential workaround besides DTF, which would be the perfect workaround? I'm going to leave that to Roy. I mean, I have my thoughts, but Roy's the expert. Well, lowering the temperature, uh, we can go down 265 to 280. The higher, the better. Obviously, you're going to sacrifice washability with that. So you can maybe double cure and that will buy you some more washes. But, um, you know, like most people, I don't think everybody washes their sweatshirt after every use especially if they're not getting it dirty. So uh, it's ten, they tend to last longer anyway in a lot of cases. So uh, that would be the thing is just run some tests because, you know, no one setting is going to work for every manufacturer's product. It really depends on the threshold of heat that was used on the dye that they uh, added to the fabric after manufacturing. So some of those heat temperatures are vary, um, and if I can get to 280 or even 300, you know, then that's better. But typically, a lot of them sometimes on 50/50s are going to fall below the 330 or 333, 340 range, which is typically where you have your heat presses at for DTG. Um, so ultimately, we got to get down below that, and then again, sacrificing washes uh, by doing so. Hey, Jay, I do know a decorator who um, uh, his workaround uh, for this product is to back off on the amount of pre-treat, pre-treat the, the, the garment, dry it, pre-treat it a second time. So basically the same amount of pre-treat, but, but half of it, dry it, half of it, dry it. And, and, and he says that that improves the quality of his print. Multiple steps, though, in um, taking you more time. So I'm going to revert back to get a better quality, higher cotton content garment to, to really resolve the issue. Yeah, it's a tough one. I, and we, we recognize that one size fits all. We recognize that your market might be a little different. We're not trying to corner you into something like I, I saw Bill's comment about, well, in his area, people are not that interested in the higher quality. They're more interested in a less expensive product. So sometimes that is going to be the scenario. Um, we're talking about a broad brush nationwide. We have seen a resurgence of things like made in America, higher quality and willingness to pay for it. They're also keenly aware and very curious about sustainability, the ethics at which these products were made. And so sometimes clients care, sometimes they just want to deal. We, we, we recognize that too. Um, we live in the real world. Um, it may not seem like it sometimes when my head's flickering around on the video, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, well, thank I thought you. you were a real person. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, uh, and, and Jay, that I think part of it too comes from us. Uh, I, I, you know, decorating that 50-50 shirt and then decorating a, a cotton-faced garment of the same color and showing that to the customer sometimes will say, listen, here's your option for this price. Here's your option for $2 more or $3 more. Uh, and, and sometimes they're going to say, oh, you know what, maybe I will go with the other. So part, being, part, of it's, part of it's on our end to educate that customer. Yeah. And there are some things that are baked into the recipe that you may not be able to avoid. Like if it's a, if it's a really fine polyester, you're, now you're dealing with heat marks, crease marks, discoloration. You know, when we talk about, when I talk about staining, we're talking about the fact that the dye will reinvigorate. And, and potentially change color. So you have, you have lots of variables and, and, and we're trying to say, well, what can we do to minimize those? Rather than try to fix the substrate, which may not be fixable, what are some other areas? What are some other potential uh, suggestions? And so that's, that's what we're trying to discuss here today. So hopefully, hopefully everybody, thank you for the comments. Love what's going on over there. And yes, you guys can help each other if you have some suggestions. Um, Roy is trying to do a good job of keeping up with those, but we may not be able to answer every single question in the chat, but please don't stop. 
occasionally we'll look at one and try to grab it or, or Roy might try to answer on the fly. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to take the next question. If that's okay with you guys, we've got a couple more here. Again, frequently asked questions, DTG and DTF tech talk. I'm going to switch gears a little bit and try to get a little bit more into the direct to transfer and the film transfer process. Um, so Roy, this question is for you and I'm going to flash this up on my screen. Um, so say goodbye to the Kansas city chiefs, Terry, um, because that's all you're going to get in this session. Um, <laughs> The next one is a DTF transfer, and uh, um, this was shared by a user in our group, and they were, you know, I, I, many people commented how cool they thought this text effect was, but the question was, how do I get rid of these lines and this banding? And so what's interesting about the question that we get a lot of times is they don't see it on the transfer, both because of the nature of the reverse order, printing CMYK or colors first and then white on top. So sometimes you don't see this until you actually press it. But maybe Roy, you could talk a little bit about that banding, what could cause that, what some of the issues are and what some of the fixes or solutions are. Well, a uh, couple things uh, is DTF is obviously a smoother uh, lay down of ink, which allows us to put less down, okay? Uh, the, the thing that will happen is if your nozzles aren't firing properly or you're missing a nozzle, especially on color, you may see banding. And that's typically what that looks like is possible banding. The resolution of the image when you're doing type is very critical when it comes to GTF. You have to make sure that you are running a higher resolution, more so than on fabric, because the fabric's going to hide a little bit of it with the absorption, okay? It's going to allow that ink dot to flatten out a little bit more. With DTF, there's nothing happening there. It's going right on the film. Whatever you see is what you end up with. So uh, the other thing is, is like I said, if uh, you're not maintaining your head properly, you get a little bit of buildup or you don't rinse your flushing or mist pad to the left with distilled water and you're constantly getting ink on your head, uh, that is going to cause issues with the spray of uh, the nozzles coming down to the, the film. The one thing is, is I do want to express is that a lot of people are always hung up on, I got to get my shirt, I got to get my film as close to the head as possible. Uh, with DTG machines, that is not what you want to do, okay? If you get the film too close to the head, you may get splashing, and that splashing is going to go back up on the nozzles, causing issues with the spray, and then subsequently, you got to run some more cleaning cycles, and it's just going to create issues with your overall quality, and you're going to have a little bit more waste. The thing with your position or platen heights, they should be a little lower. That allows for more latitude uh, the further you are away. You do have the ability to set what, they call, what I call focus, which is your head alignment where it's allowing the droplets to fall on top of each other uh, rather than getting too technical. We are adding a series of droplets on top of each other, kind of like stack, stacking pancakes. So when you see passes, that's what that means. So if my focus is off, my dots could separate because I'm going to do bi-directional printing. If I have four passes, that's two drops coming one way to another and I could uh, potentially have two lines that are printing or a fuzzy edge because the dots are not sitting on top of each other exactly. So love that. if That's you need help with anything like that, you can always reach out to our tech support, put in a ticket, uh, go on our website, put in a ticket or call our office. That's the best way to do it. And again, uh, try not to, to move to a P position with your film because that's going to create more issues than not. The other thing is there's a lot of settings out there that people are using. And the first thing people want to run to is how can I save money on the output? So they want to go with the lowest setting. I could tell you with DTF on the F2100, you need to be at PL5 in order to get the optimal print quality and the least amount of banding issues with your images. So I love it when, when Roy uses examples like pancakes, because that's, that's for me, I can relate to that. 
Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's a great analogy and it really makes sense. I can visualize those droplets coming down like little pancakes. And if they're not exactly aligned, then that's what's happening. And I also appreciate the fact that you talk about the banding could be from the nozzle and it could be from buildup on the nozzle. Like it could be a nozzle that's mm -hmm. not clear or it could be some crud. You could not really see it, but when you're spraying, you're leaving that little channel, that little line, and it just keeps repeating as it goes back and forth. So I'm gonna flash that back up on my screen because I think even though this could have been a super cool um, textural um, fill pattern, I don't think that that's what they wanted. And in fact, of course, they expressed that that was a problem and they wanted to know why it was happening. Um, and so, there were there were there were a few reasons why this could have been happening, and I appreciate you covered them all, Roy. Um, Terry, what do you think? Do you think that's like a cool pattern, or or would you see this and go, uh? Oh yeah, yeah. absolutely. If if somebody showed it to me and think, oh man, that's awesome. Oh, you didn't mean to do that. Oh, that's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but you know, Roy touched on something there that uh, you know in his conversation, uh, saying that that there are things to do to maintain your machine and. And it's not difficult to maintain a DTG or a DTF printer, but you still need to do it. And, and um, it's, you know, when something seems so simple, I think that some people think, well, I guess it's not that important. And, and it is important and easy to maintain, but you must follow the steps in maintenance. Excellent. All right. Well, listen, and I love that fact about the focus point that Roy brings up. I've heard him explain that about two or 300 times over the phone to people um, that, you know, just because you can move it closer doesn't mean you should. And that what you're really trying to do is grab that optimal print. And so the printer needs space and it needs room for those print heads to fire and those nozzles to vibrate and the right amount of ink to stack on top. So um, Roy, thank God you're here because not only can you explain it better than I can, but you actually know what you're saying and you can fix it. So not to out anybody, but I just wanted to throw something in on that. I had a customer that had a, a online store and he had a huge volume and he was trying to keep it minimal as far as the amount of people. He was only printing on some light garments with specific printers. So there was no pre-treat involved and he didn't want to pre-press the shirts. So he was putting the shirts down wrinkled. Okay, using the frame to kind of hold them down. But with that wrinkled surface, he was having issues. Now we set his platen height to four and was able to set his head alignment at four and he was able to get a good quality print off of those shirts without pre-pressing them. There you go. I see not that you saying. want to run and do something like that, but. <laughs> Right. That's, kind of not, that's, you, that's outside you, of the normal boundaries, but the right. yeah, point, exactly. but point is well made. Um, if you insist on doing it my way, we could probably help you work around. And, and you know, as Roy mentioned before, when in doubt, give us a call, reach out to us and, and, and we can, uh, we, Roy and the rest of the uh, support team, we, we'd be more than we, happy to we, help you. We excluding Jay and Terry. Um, <laughs> it was Roy, the greater we. Yes, Roy, you, <laughs> mentioned, you mentioned PL5. I thought I heard you say PL5. Platinum level five, is that what you meant by that? or No, PL5 was print level five. Okay. So when we go into Garment Creator, we have our print level five, which is there starts with one, two, three, four, five, six. Six is the highest grade. So five is where you need to be for the DTF. I know some people out there were trying to use level one and then change some of the color settings in there. Uh, you need to have enough ink saturation on the color because the white, you can only go negative 50. With that, you're gonna wash out some colors. So level five gives you the ability to add a little bit more ink as well to try to maintain the color spectrum. So, as well as having a higher resolution and avoiding some of the banding issues. Gotcha. And Jay, could I quickly add something? Uh, I just came back from the Impressions Expo show in Atlantic City and um, it's a surprising number of people, probably the majority of people who came by that own an F2100 were still at this point not aware that they could do DTF transfers on their F2100. Mm -hmm. And there is 
uh, an update to Garment Creator that will uh, make that an easier task. So that's something that that our our uh, all of our support staff can help you with as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. Uh, there was uh, someone mentioning on the uh, Cathario rip as well. Uh, our Easy Rip mimics Garment Creator. So when you see, uh, or if you were to purchase our Cathario rip, it will say PL5 or uh, PL6 in there. So uh, it's just kind of helping peak customers migrate easier rather than creating some other uh, confusing jargon. The biggest difference Agreed. between the Cathari and the, the uh, garment creator is how it lays down the white ink. Uh, it does lay it down differently, which allows for using less white on a lot of garments. So if you're doing a lot of work and you want to save a little bit of money, Cathari is definitely an item to look at or our easy rip, I should say. Um, and we offer some technical support and training on that as well. So it's not like you're going to end up buying something and you're kind of on your own. Uh, there are DTF settings within our RIP, uh, as well as being able to do it with uh, Garment Creator. So your average savings out there, just because people are wondering, it's between 20 and 25% on average. So uh, if you're spending 2000 a month on ink, uh, that's going to add up real quick. So uh, you can okay. save what potentially three four hundred dollars a month on uh, ink, and uh, that'll pay for the rip in no time. And, yeah, and just to clarify, the the Cathari rip that that Roy is referring to, our easy rip is a Cathari rip. So yeah, I was going to say the same mm -hmm. thing so that people aren't confused. There but, is a Cathari tool out there from other folks that is a standard stock off the shelf rip. There is the easy rip, which is powered by Cathari, and we've done some modifications and made it a little simpler. And it's something that we can support. Obviously, if you're buying it from us, we're going to give you some TLC and some love. Um, and RIP softwares may not be necessary for anybody. It, it's just a tool in the toolbox. It's not the key to unlock all success. Uh, so, it, but it can be like, like they have. You know, Roy's mentioned it can it can be a tool that can can increase some of your other feature sets as well as decrease your costs, uh, especially on the white ink. So. For those of you that are new, that just got lost because we had a discussion about Cathari and Easy Rip, I don't want you to worry. No panicking allowed. Garment creator first. We're going to crawl, then we're going to walk, and then we're going to run. And we tell everybody the same. And correct me if I'm wrong, Terry. We pretty much try to get people to not, especially if they're new, to not invest immediately in Rip software. That they ought to try Garment Creator first. Is that would you two both agree with that, or did I overstep my bounds? I 100% agree, and yeah. most of our yeah. customers use Garment Creator. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the RIP is a little bit more, well, it depends, I guess you could say. If you want to just install it and use it, just like you use Garment Creator, then there's nothing wrong with that. But if if you are get overwhelmed by the screen and think, oh, I got to tweak this, I got to tweak that, uh, it's a little bit more complex. So if you're not... Uh, savvy on the computer and you're kind of jumping into the digital spectrum here as far as DTG and DTF, then obviously you want to take it a little slow and get the garment creator down first and then migrate over as time goes on. So, All right. Perfect. Very good. Well, we're going to throw it back over to you, my friend, Mr. Mr. Combs, our senior All right. sales representative and trainer, senior. <laughs> so Roy, this is a question that's uh, both for DTG and DTF printers. Uh, how important are nozzle checks? What should I do if mine show broken lines or unprinted areas? Is there an order or prescription to follow with nozzle checks? Yes. Okay, every <laughs> <Yes>. Epson <laughs> Just yes. comes with a chart. It's laminated. You can even use dry ease pens on it, I tell customers. So follow that chart. With the F2100, uh, it's designed for your stay-at-home mom, not uh, knocking anything, that may use it once a week to your high production shops that run eight-hour shifts plus. So the cleaning cycles on that machine, it keeps track of the volume of shirts that it's printing, and it also cleans accordingly. If you're doing enough printing, you can turn off that startup cleaning. I do not recommend doing that 
if you're not running it five day five days a week, at least eight hours a day. Uh, it doesn't use that much ink if you're running it quite a bit. Uh, the most it's going to go through on a startup cleaning cycle usually is somewhere right around four dollars worth of ink. So if you turn it on once a week, uh, you know you print 20, 25 shirts, you're going to cover that cost fairly easily if you're doing retail. Um, and if you're doing wholesale and giving it away, which if you go on our Facebook group, we do have a great group of people and I've seen people converse about pricing and what to charge. Uh, people don't generally give away DTG uh, printing or even the DTF because there's more labor involved. So you definitely want to keep that in mind. Plus the quality of the prints and the vibrancy of prints that you can accomplish with DTG and DTF as much uh more than uh, say uh, silk screening, but getting back to your maintenance. So typically you're shaking your white ink when you start the machine and you tell the, co the machine that you've done so, it does its startup cleaning. As soon as it boots up, the first thing you do is a nozzle check. And if you're missing any color nozzles, you have to address them immediately because colors are less likely to clog. And as far as the whites go, I tell people if you're missing more than one or two, uh, then you definitely want to go through and get that clean and up and going. Uh, if the if you're running your machine frequently and you're missing those one or two, please keep a track of where those were. And if you're missing in the same place the next time you turn it on, next day, a couple of days later, then you must address those. Because if you don't, if you let too much time pass, then they'll be gone forever. If you're under warranty, you can get a new head put in free of charge from Epson. Part of the reason why Epson gives you a, the head in the warranty is because of the, uh, the cleaning cycles and the shutdown procedures that the machine does. Getting back to another time we did a video on should we leave it off or turn it off, uh, leave it on or turn it off. So uh, the machine cleans itself and flushes itself on the shutdown. And you, you want to do that while the ink is still damp in the lines versus uh, having the machine stay on and maybe it run a cleaning cycle with the uh, cleaning solution, which isn't as frequent and the ink's already starting to dry in the lines, it's not going to do as good of a job. All right. Um... Yes. Yeah. On the $4 worth of ink, that would be the most. So if I let my machine sit idle for 12 to 14 days maximum, which is Epson's recommendation, if you have it off, it's going to go through about $4 worth of ink. The more frequently I turn on the machine, the more shirts I print when I turn it on, the less it's going to go through, the quicker the cleaning cycles are. Okay, so at the, if I'm running my machine every single day, but I'm only running say 20, 25 shirts and it's not running eight hours, then you're probably go through uh, 50, 80 cents worth of ink on a boot up. So it's not going to be $4 typically. So, yeah, so typically uh, when Roy, you see a, tech, a 19, so he, 20 minute clean. Right. Roy's a tech. So he's going to give you the, the, the extreme of it. So it, yeah. it generally, if you're running your machine regularly, you have a, you have a, a, a vibrant business and, and you're running shirts every day. No, it's not going to be $4 when you boot up the machine. So yeah, exactly. great, great question, John. And everybody wanted to ask that same question. So uh, even I was texting Terry going, wait, we better clarify that $4. <laughs> <laughs> but Roy, you did a fabulous job. Thank you for explaining that. Um, I think it's really a, a big part of the nozzle check. So we didn't get into this specifically, Roy, but don't you recommend every day that's the first thing people do when they come into their shop turn on their printer do a nozzle check um across the board so uh first thing you do it's like uh if i'm gonna go on a long trip with my car i want to check the tires the oil my brakes all that good stuff so if i'm going to start a day of production and i want to make sure everything is correct then i do the starter procedures with the epson I do a nozzle check. When I start up my pre-treater, same thing. I check my nozzle. I check my spray. 
uh, make sure that first shirt coming off there looks really good. Otherwise, I address my nozzles over there and replace them, clean them, whatever. And then uh, watch the heat press, cure that first shirt, watch that first shirt come off the printer. I actually always put a pause on the first shirt of the day if I'm in production and check the white, see how it's laying down. So I can see that my whole process is going perfectly and then I don't have to look back. If my environment's where it needs to be, humidity and temperature, I can start my production and never look back that day and every shirt, shirt after shirt, is going to be perfect. I love that. You're trying to Providing I'm, I'm buying good shirts. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're not, that's, that's another webinar. We've done that webinar and we'll probably do it again. But I like the fact that you're, you're closing all of these trap doors before you get started into a production run. That's really wise, number one. And number two, I wanted to ask, looking at this, the picture on our screen, you know, the cyan, magenta, yellow, and black look perfect. I can't even see a break but obviously the white is far from perfect. So if I came in yeah, after having successfully printed day after day after day, and it's now, what day is it? It's now Taco Tuesday. And I come in and I boot up my printer and I print and that's what it looks like. What would you tell me to do first? Um, I would tell you to, and that many are missing. I would say go straight to a medium queen for all the white channels. Okay. The one thing that I do here in tech support that we get all the time is people will do mediums, then they're into heavies. I've done a bunch of cleans, just wasted a ton of ink because you do heavy cleans. That's easy. Going to be $4 worth of ink. Okay. If you do more than three heavies in a row, you can actually damage the machine because it creates too much suction at the nozzle and it can create issues with the membranes and cause the heads to leak. So ultimately, it does say that in the manual as well. I do recommend you download it, okay? So definitely wanna, there was some mention too of turning it on or leaving it off. Uh, look at our YouTube, there is a video for that. So, uh, and that goes through the whole thing. I mean, that's, that's another subject in itself. So just uh, check that out. But again, the key thing is, is making sure you don't over clean because that costs money. And if you're not doing your job of taking care of the printer, then obviously you're not going to get good nozzles. So number one, if I do more than two medium cleans in a situation like that, and I don't get my nozzles back, then I go straight to doing my suction cap clean. People get a lot of suction errors because they're not keeping up with that. The suction cap is the most important part of cleaning that you need to physically do with the printer. Uh, and a lot of people don't realize how the ink gets through the system. It's through that suction cap. So if you're not cleaning that seal, it's like sucking on a straw that has a crack in it. The ink's not going to get pulled through the system properly. You're going to uh, amplify your nozzle losses that way too, because if, if it's not, the ink isn't flowing, the nozzles are going to start clogging. So definitely keep that in mind. So after doing a suction cap clean, then I would go back and do another medium clean. If I'm on top of my printer, 99.9% .9 of the time, I'm going to be good to go after that. So maximum cleans would be three mediums for me. Uh, a, a heavy shouldn't even be used for at least eight, nine months of a printer's life. Uh, maybe once a year, if that, or twice a year, you'd be using a heavy clean. Uh, if you happen to leave the printer sit a little longer than normal, uh, then I would go ahead and, and do that. But uh, other than that, the biggest thing is keep up on your warranty. So if this machine is, is making you money and you look at that $1,800, it's not a lot of money to pay at the end of the day if that is your business and you're making a good income off of it. It's, it's insurance, so to speak, because I've seen over the last five years, three, four, five customers that run their machines every day, eight plus hours a day, having one machine, because they may have multiples, that Epson comes out and can't fix. They will replace the machine if you've extended your warranty, and they have to do something. So they, I've seen a lot of machines get replaced. Uh, they'll try to fix it first, but if they can't, 
you get a new machine. That's cheaper than buying a new one. So that's your insurance. It does come up and it's tough. It's a business decision, but we, we are obviously pro extend your warranty or service agreement as Matt Realm would call it. Um, so, okay. It comes back to me. Were there any other questions there? A lot, a lot of chat going on about DTF and colors. By the way, that is on our future DTG and DTF uh, tech talk. It's something that's going to be specific to color, um, how to deal with color, how to try to hit certain colors. We won't have all of the answers, but hopefully together with our team and with some experienced folks, we're going to have a future session that's going to deal just with colors because we could literally have a 25 minute discussion on how to hit purples or how to hit, you know, how do I get my greens to look more neon, which comes up all the time. So um, there are limitations to your printer, by the way, you're not going to hit every color. So knowing where those boundaries are is really important. And we will definitely have more uh, sessions dealing with that topic. Um, so Terry, did I take your question? Is that what happened? Is that why I'm looking at this? No, no, what? it's your, uh, we're ready for question number four. Okay. Okay. So we're, we're rounding <laughs> third, we're heading home. Um, I'm going to share my screen again, and, and this will, this will make you happy, Terry, because you know, today is Tuesday after all. And so uh -huh. with Tuesday, we often in Arizona and at my house, whoops, we often have <laughs> the classic. Look at my, <laughs> well, at least you can hear me. Um, so this is a great example and, and it comes up a lot. It's really two issues here. Um, hopefully my, uh -huh. my head will stop fluttering and doing that digital dance. But in the meantime, you can still hear me. So we've got some issues here, uh, Mr. Mr. Roy, Mr. Tech Man. And it's more than one issue. And when I shared the sample with you um, in, in setting up, this was a great example. We get this a lot and I put some arrows on it. So the first one on the left, Roy, what's, what's happening here? Why am I seeing white show through my color? That color teal okay. doesn't look solid. It looks like there are little white oaks, fibers, something, something showing through. What's going on there? Well, a couple things here is, when did that occur? The biggest thing is, is uh, did it happen while printing or did it happen after the cure? Okay. Mm. On this specific one, looks to me like it's happened possibly through the print process. Okay. So again, there's one thing is you didn't place an arrow where uh, I thought you would, but there's actually a, a fourth thing or actually a second thing there you said. So there's two. Oh, they the the box down on to the right there so the biggest thing here is looking at the fibers okay am i pressing my fibers down i always tell people when i do training get a magnifying glass okay go to the dollar tree we talked about these droplets and their pancakes you can't see them with the naked eye a 1440 by a 1440 droplet you can't see it okay so i'm compiling droplets on the fabric to create uh, it's like if you looked at a mountain range and I was starting to just fill that in with snow, okay? Eventually, it's going to fill in, okay? That's what I'm doing. So with the pre-treat, I'm doing that first, and then I need to cure it. Undercured pre-treat allows the ink to stay wetter and also allows the ink to migrate through the fabric layer. So if you have a situation where you pull your shirt off of the, the printer and there's white ink that's just penetrated through the fabric to the backside, uh, the inside of the back of the shirt. Uh, that's completely a pre-treat issue, adding too much ink to compensate, and it's just sucking right through the fabric. So uh, the pre-treat should keep the pigments on the surface of the fabric if you pre-treat and cure correctly. So uh, I've never had ink penetrate the fabric layer at all, even on the inside of the first layer. So um, just keep that in mind. So with that, if you're curing your shirt and letting it naturally dry and it's a heavy fiber shirt, the fibers are gonna stick out. And if you go to print, those are gonna hold the white ink on the surface. If you're not putting enough color to, to down to cover it, then you're gonna have the white showing through like that. Uh, that's not normal, though. I mean, the biggest issue in situations like this would be curing 
the ink and doing it too quickly. So uh, you got to look at the ink and how it's, um, I guess, how it goes on the fabric and how the water migrates into the fabric. So if I have a correctly pre-treated shirt, it is cured correctly, which means it's 100% dry, not damp. Okay, it's 100% dry. Then the white ink goes down. The water from the ink is going to penetrate that pretreat layer and absorb into the fabric, and the pigments stay on the surface. Then when the color goes down, that water has to penetrate through the white layer and then into the fabric. Okay, so keep that in mind. While that's happening, if there's any water in that white layer still and I go to press that shirt, guess what? It's going to create steam, and the steam's going to push the ink around, forcing some white to come back up to the surface, okay, creating little marks like that. So potentially this could be a uh, issue where the shirt was had too much ink on it. It was cured too quickly. That's, again, getting back to a statement I made early on was let your shirt sit three to five minutes before you press them. Don't just run to the heat press thinking you got to do it right away. So focus on feeding that printer. As long as the printer's running, your production's still moving. At the end of the day, you might have a couple shirts to cure, or another five minutes worth of curing or something of that nature. Not a big deal. At the beginning of the day, I'm focused on pre-treating and curing shirts to keep feeding the printer. So, you know, your startup is focusing on the pre-treated shirts. The end of the day is going to be focusing on those final cures that you got to do. So you're going to see less issues like this. Uh, and again, if the shirt has a lot of fiber sticking up and you didn't press it properly, uh, the other thing is, and I'm seeing this out there a little bit more because people are getting confused with this. If I pre-treat a shirt and I cure the shirt, there's a time limit to printing. Okay. If you don't print on that shirt within 20 to 30 minutes, I tell people we press it because the fibers are going to start popping up again. Uh, moisture is going to absorb back into the fabric. We need to make sure the shirt is dry for the pre-treat to do its job. So, and the barrier part that we discussed is kind of temporary. Uh, you know, we take shirts to shows all the time that are pre-treated in advance. They can sit months in a light tight container, uh, even a year or more. It depends on how you store them. Uh, and then just take them out. First thing you do is you, you uh, pre-treat, I mean, not pre-treat, you just put them in the heat press and you pull the moisture out. People want to rush that, okay? The colder the temperature, uh, the more humidity you have, the longer that takes. So right now in some parts of the country, it could take 35 seconds or more to press a shirt and pull all the moisture and flatten it out because that shirt is cold because uh, you're in an environment where you're barely keeping above 60 degrees or, or 65 in some cases. I was training someone about a week or so ago, and it was uh, right around 60 in her shop the whole time. I mean, she was wearing a sweatshirt. And she couldn't get it hot, hotter because it was, you know, cement walls and all this stuff. And that's the best she could do. But ultimately, she had to press a little bit longer because that fabric's got to warm up in order for the uh, water or moisture to evaporate. And then the, the fibers to flatten out. So anyway, uh, just throwing and that again, that would be that would be an extreme situation. Most of us are not in a shop like that. So you, you mm -hmm. shouldn't anticipate having to, to repress that shirt for 40 seconds in your shop. Okay. Yeah, so exactly. Roy, Most of Roy, the time it's 15 to 35 is what I throw out there. Okay. Being in Arizona, I have the life of luxury because I can press for about 15 seconds in the summer mainly, but right now, maybe a couple seconds longer. Second item on here is your uh, reduced white area. You're so the small, the small letters for, you can see, I yeah. just want everybody to know that where it says Taco Tuesday and all of those letters, it almost looks like a different font now, like it's a stamp font. There, there, that should be continuous. There should be no breaks in the A, the C, the O, the top of the mm -hmm. T, the U. There should be no breaks at all. And yet because of the problem, it looks like every little letter has a gap or it's missing something. Yeah, those fine lines, when, I re when you reduce, 
You look at the T's on the top, that's a prime example of what Jay was just saying. Do you see that uh, line that comes across right here uh, to connect the two pieces? Yes. And then down below the T, you don't see it. And that's because it, it's thinner down there because it's smaller face. And when you do handwriting and things of that nature, you're going to have such a fine line. If there's no white for the color to sit on when you're doing a dark garment, the color ink will absorb into the fabric and disappear. Okay. So with the reduced white uh, to two, which is the norm, uh, there's not enough white there. So you need to change it from two to one in order to pick that line up. Okay. Uh, the other thing is, is a lot of people I hear are changing their reduced white area all the time to three or four or something of that nature. Um, I've only changed it about five times in close to five years. Okay. It's not something you should be changing all the time. Uh, this would be one instance to change it. Uh, but as far as when you're seeing white appear in the outer perimeter of a graphic, Let's say I'm printing something like this, and I see a white line on just one side of it, not the whole thing. As a, If you have your white is too big, it'll be a pinstripe around the whole job, a perfect uh, size line. If it's only appearing randomly in different areas, that's because a lot of people that use their frame for loading shirts, they overstretch them. Uh, we have a rubber gasket on our frames. So when you push it down, it pulls the garment in all four directions evenly. Uh, when you're manually doing it with an Epson frame, uh, I see people, they get in a hurry and then they pull too hard on one side and it overstretches it. So you end up with a line that's erratic in different areas. And it's not consistent from shirt to shirt either. But they just automatically, oh, let's just change the uh, reduced white to three or four. And then you end up losing... Um, on the other end, because the quality of your print starts shifting uh, because you don't have enough white around the outer perimeter. Well, that's an excellent discussion. I appreciate that. We have a, a very vibrant chat going on. Um, uh, one question uh, I'm going to throw to Terry because I know you know the answer. Pre-treat machine and the F2100, can they be in the same room? Or does that create humidity issues? No, absolutely. Uh, you you can. Uh, most of our customers have the machine right that. next to their printer. If you look in our showroom, uh, East Coast and West Coast, the pre-treat machine is sitting right next to the printer. So you absolutely no problem at all. Because first of all, it's enclosed. The pre-treat machine's enclosed. So it's not introducing any uh, atomized pre-treat into the air. So that, that would be your only concern would be an open pre-treat machine. Um, but uh, as humidity wise, that sort of thing, uh, perfectly fine. So some of the questions that y'all have been asking have been wonderful in every way, and they have already been addressed in other videos. So I want you to know that if you didn't know, we do record these and then we add them to our YouTube channel. So Roy has a whole bunch of videos that he sends to each of our customers before he even starts the training process so that they can become more familiar with the, the setup and more familiar with the process. And then it doesn't feel so unnatural or new when a technician is, is stepping you through and guiding you through that. So please go back to watch those videos. It does not mean we're not gonna take your questions. Just, I just want people to know that they might be able to find the very answer they're searching for on our YouTube channel. So um, love that. And yes, we will be adding new videos more videos on the easy jet. Um, we have been in the process of that for a week and it's probably gonna take a couple more, but we're hurrying and doing everything we can as fast as we can without um, making mistakes. <laughs> and Roy knows what I'm talking about there. So- um, Yeah, we'll be making more videos on our easy jet as time goes on. Uh, there was a couple references here to the white ink and, and we kind of touched on that. And as Jay just mentioned, we have three garment creator videos. We have one that's an overview. Okay, so just go to our YouTube station uh, and uh, just search within our videos for garment creator. Uh, the other one is strictly printing on dark garments with a white base. What is my focus? 
obviously the white ink is the focus and how it goes down on the shirt. If we start explaining things like that here, it's going to turn this into a much longer webinar. So uh, I recommend you go watch that video if you have any questions on printing on dark garments. And then we also have one on printing on light garments. So head on over and watch that one too if you have questions on the best way to printing on light garments. So the two things that are takeaways, light garments, it's all about the color ink and how much you put down on the fabric. Dark garments, it's all about the white base and the pre-treating. So if you don't have the right white down, you're not going to get a good print. I don't care how much color ink you put on top of it, unless you're like some of these people I've seen put YouTubes out that have seven, eight, nine, ten dollars worth of ink on a shirt, <laughs> and they're getting a spectacular what? shirt, but they're doing it just by adding all this ink. And they don't realize what they're doing on the other end is not correct. And that's why they're doing all this stuff by adding all the things. So anyway, okay. uh, just thought I'd throw that out there. Yeah, thank you. And I appreciate that. That was one of the do not forget to mention moments. Um, and, you, and you jumped ahead, which is fine. No, no, we're not worried about the order. We just want to make sure that we can cover it. One of the other things that Roy did mention was everyone that's listening today, everyone that's here, whether you have purchased a printer from us or not, you are welcome to, to fill out a technical support form on our website and ask these questions and get the help. Now, of course, we're doing it on a first come first serve basis. So if everybody today floods this and we have 67 different questions, it's gonna take a little bit of time before we can get back to you because you know we do have a large tech team. Um, we do have multiple folks in, in New Jersey and here in Arizona. So we're gonna do the best we can to get back to you. But I wanted everybody to know that that is something that if you have an F2100, no matter where you purchased it, we will be happy to help you uh, to the point that we know the answers, right? So um, use us as a resource. We wanna be seen as a resource. And uh, we appreciate um, Roy and all of the techs who do such a great job while juggling demos, while juggling new startups and trainings. We're taking turns at answering questions either via email or from, or from the phone. So that's something that's available to you. If you did not know that, now you do. Um, and then, of course, to reiterate what Roy said, please visit and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We have over 100 VTG. Um, some of them are fun and marketing based. Some of them are very specific on a topic. Um, so, you know, check them out. They're there for you. That's uh, something that we, we feel like is a part of our um, success at Equipment Zone is to be able to continue to provide this uh, training and, and resource and technical support. Um, so without that, uh, I don't know that we would be who we are. That's definitely for us one of our pillars uh, and what differentiates us from, from others in the industry. So if you have any questions, you can definitely reach out um, for products. If you are interested in sales, um, these are the sales folks. So notice that I'm leading with key contact information for Terry and Amy, who is listening. Um, wonderful humans. They, of course, are in sales, but they understand the industry and they are here for you. So you could use them as the start of a conversation and decide whether it needs to go to tech support. Um, email them, give them a quick email and see what they think, and they'll point you in the right direction. Of course, you can go to our website, equipmentzone.com. You can call us on the 800 number. Um, and Roy, from time to time, is the guy who's going to be answering those, and sometimes he's not. It depends. It rotates around. So I don't want you to think if you talk to Miguel or Sophia or somebody else, um, that's okay, too. Um, so before we go, is there anything else, Roy or Terry, that you would like to add? Uh, I'll add uh, oh, Bill Celeste commented here that that hands down the best support in the industry. So we appreciate Roy and all the tech crew that that take care of uh, all of our customers and sometimes other people's customers. <laughs> indeed, indeed, that's our best customer. Someone that bought from somebody else. <laughs> yeah, and then they come and they, get, they get... Uh, realize they weren't taken care of, you know, and they end up over here. Then. From that point forward, uh, they continue to stay with us. And I think the key too, and this is what I tell people in training with all the videos we've done from marketing, because if, if you don't, uh, if you have a machine and you know how to use it, doesn't mean you can't get out there and make money doing it. So you got to have that marketing aspect of it too. So, and we help you in every aspect. We want you to be successful. And if you're not, we haven't done our job. 
Thank well you. said, my friend. Well said. All right. Well, we'll let everybody get back to printing t-shirts and hats and hoodies, all the good stuff to make you the real money. Um, this is going to be a continuing series. Other series will have different topics, different examples. So we look forward to it. If you'd like to follow up with me, you can. If you have a suggestion for a future topic, I'm always listening. Um, so thank you for your chat and your questions. Um, thank you, Roy. Thank you, Terry. Uh, until we see each other in moments in the real world. Um, thanks for everybody for tuning in for another DTG and DTF Tech Talk uh, from Equipment Zone. Uh, be safe, be good, and see y'all later. All right, thank you.